Our uh, next to last uh, presentation um, is going to be about absenteeism and, and we've seen a lot today about how we can maximize the abilities of our students but the most important ability is availability and if you're not there you can't succeed. So um, ladies and gentlemen, all the hey. Good afternoon everybody. Thank you all for uh, taking time out of your day to join us. I would like to begin by recognizing the efforts of my colleague Lisa Palmer who cannot be with us today but she and I worked together on trying to identify and outline what it would take to, as James said, get more kids into the, into the seats, into the classroom. So I'm going to be talking about a, a few different things, uh, some of which we've heard before. Unfortunately, I do not have any data on free or reduced lunch. Um, <laughs> and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start by apologizing for right there. I've been in the district for 12 years. And a constant theme in that 12 years are teachers lamenting, if only we had an attendance policy. Okay, well, we have one. We do have an attendance policy. And what we've looked at through our research is the idea that attendance and absenteeism are more complex than simply here or not here. So what our goal was, was to try and identify a segment of the population it could be identified, it could be supported, it could be brought back into the classrooms uh, efficiently, effectively, and also very popular in this district, free. So <laughs> why is this important? Um, this kind of falls under the no duh topic. Of course it's important. I, I'm a teacher. I would be very foolish if I stood in my classroom and it was empty doing what I do. I need the kids there. However, there are more measurable links to that. Uh, student engagement is one of the single greatest determinants to success. If a student is not feeling that the class is pers uh, purposeful, excuse me, if the student does not feel they have a personal connection to it, if the student does not feel that they are getting something out of it, they're not going <coughs> to pay attention, they're not going to do the work, they're not going to participate. Their motivation for attending has gone down. And we know that student attendance affects things like graduation rates. It's also linked to future performance, income, job, life, um, satisfaction. All of those measures do go back to going to class. Uh, and again, as other present, uh, slow down, as other presenters have mentioned today, there's that same idea that what we're trying to get our kids used to is understanding their responsibility and instructing them on how to match whatever that responsibility is. One of the other things we found out was that school attendance is more important in certain transitional years, namely sixth grade and ninth grade. More than just being transitions, the research suggests that at the sixth grade and ninth grade year, the role of the adult changes in the student's life. This is where we see cracks opening up wider. As students become more cognitively able, they are able to do higher level work. As educators, that's what we're throwing at them. Our support for their social emotional needs diminishes. And our level of expertise in our content area, our demands go up our attention to these other factors go down. So what we see is at sixth and ninth grade, the role of student attendance uh, explodes. It, it becomes far more important. All right, so one of the things that I noticed early on was that words differ. What does it mean to be absent? What does it mean to be present? That's a fun topic that we'll save for another time. <laughs> Absentee is divided into several different categories. Low chronic versus high chronic. And they have been defined, and I, I kind of normalize this, but uh, Kearney, who's done a lot of work, Havoc, who's done a lot of work, kind of reinforced this idea that everybody's out. 3% or less of a semester is considered low chronic. Doesn't have to be consecutive. It's just uh, within a time frame. High chronic, 15% or more within a semester. Now, with a 90-day semester, you're looking at 12 days. If you're out 12 days, that's huge. 
looking at data from north from the first semester of last academic year, 22% of our students met that. High chronic. Now, when looking at absenteeism, and, and as I've listened to colleagues over the years, going back to this amorphous attendance policy, we see that National School District's attendance policy identifies only one category of attendance issues, and that is truancy. Well, we're going to break it down to legitimate and illegitimate, because where I have seen conflict in the conversation is everybody can come up with a legitimate reason to be out. It's the illegitimate reasons, however, that our policy addresses, but only half, because there are two forms of illegitimate attendance, or I'm sorry, two forms of illegitimate absenteeism, truancy and school refusal. The goal of our project was to identify school refusal and to come up with a plan to address it. It is my contention that the current policy only focuses on truancy, and what I hope to show you today is that even then, we're setting our kids up for failure. So our proposals are gonna work at identifying school refusal, but reducing both truant and school refusal absenteeism. So, what is truancy? When we imagine our frequent flyers, when we picture those kids who are never in class, they're the ones who categorize as that truant student, the one who just doesn't come. And indicators in, uh, to truancy break down to both in school and out of school. More than just not reading at grade level, more than just not feeling that engagement. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I apologize, I teach upper level classes here at North, in the, I teach behavioral science, I teach social studies. I have a lot of AP kids. I have a lot of AP kids who just don't care anymore, which may be why they're roaming the halls. But for a lot of them, they got it. They're done. They're ready for the next thing, but we're keeping them here. So their motivation to be here is gone. They don't want to be. They're not getting any more. So whether you are not reading at grade level, whether you don't have the social support at home, or whether you're just ready for the next thing, you're, you're not doing it here. We also have a very large segment of the population, and here's where my free and reduced lunch data would come in, there are out-of-school needs. We have students who are breadwinners for their family. We have students who are working 40-hour work weeks and trying to do school. We have students who need to take care of their siblings. Mom and dad are already gone. It's their job to get them up for school. High schools start at 720. If you're responsible for getting your elementary or middle school sibling on the bus, you're not coming to block one. You're not gonna make it. So these are all the uh, issues that affect truant students. So what is school refusal? <clears throat> school, refusal ugh, school refusal is defined as negative emotions about being in the school environment. There is something that is preventing them from being engaged while they're here. A perceived academic inadequacy Subjective, uh, somatic health concerns. This is, and this is if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. My stomach hurts, I can't go to school. Well, oh, wait a minute, right? We start looking at these issues that students and parents play upon to avoid confronting what is really the issue. Being here bothers me. There is tension, bullying. There is, again, a, a perceived learning difficulties. The teacher is asking me to do hard stuff. I don't know how to do this, and I don't want to try. Our uh, project looked at how can we identify these students and then direct specific efforts at them. What we used to base our determination on was the response to intervention model. And this RTI model is used frequently in lots of areas, discipline, special education, support services, and absenteeism. And I'm just going to give you a, a quick explanation of this context for the other data. This bottom tier, tier one, universal. 80% of our students, the attendance policy that we have works for them. Hey, you're supposed to be at school. Great. 
I'll come, no problem. Because our attendance policy is written with such a high standard, 20 days, which is what our Nashua School District policy states, 20 days, then we're gonna get involved. That's a lot. So our policy is written for tier three. These are the chronic high absentee truant kids. They are not coming for both legitimate and illegitimate reasons. Well, looped into that is this middle tier, these school refusal kids who would be here if they could get the support that they need. Problems that we have is because our policy is written with such a high standard, these kids who could be in the low chronic absenteeism end up in the high chronic absenteeism because they're not identified. So how do we identify them? The way our system works right now, it is an ad hoc catch as catch can association between administrators, administrative assistants, guidance counselors, other uh, support services, literary, uh, literacy coordinators, homeless outreach coordinators, uh, drug coordinators, um, drug coordinators, that's a funny statement, isn't it? <laughs> counselors. <laughs> yeah, I hear exactly. <laughs> We have. And the idea is, is that when a massive list created by X2 comes out, it lists everybody who's not been in a class, whether they checked in at 740 or 1150, they're counted. If you left at 145 instead of 203, you're counted. So what we see is a large number that has to be cross-referenced. A attentive teacher, a guidance counselor, a school psychologist will pick up on trends and then raise flags. But often those trends aren't identified until day five, day seven, day 10. Then it goes to that issue. One of the things that makes monitoring students difficult is the, and I don't wanna just blame something, but X2 takes a lot of information and it's hard to sort through. It is hard for different components to talk to each other, to identify trends early enough. What the school nurses see, those psychosomatic symptoms that I referenced earlier, what the school psychologist sees, reports of nervousness, tend to not find their way out easily because there's no way to disseminate that information quickly and easily. Like I said, it's got to be collated and sorted through by a number of different people. But because we have all these things, and we have X2, it is assumed, presumed, hoped, that we could build some functionality into it to lower that bar, lower that threshold down, so that reports could be generated quickly and easily, identifying those kids who are starting to show those symptoms of school refusal. <clears throat> So what might that look like? And I'm jumping a lot here, I apologize. First off, it is our recommendation that the stated policy in Nashua lower the bar from 20 days to something more reasonable like matching the New Hampshire state standard, which is 10 half days. If we're going to leave everything the same, if we lower that bar, what will happen is the kids who are truant still gonna get caught in that net. The kids who are school refusal will be identified sooner. Instead of having a 20 day or a 10 or 20 day absence, now we're looking more at that three to five day trend. We can start to connect students with needs to the support services that are already here. Another aspect of this problem that needs to be addressed is, I've been out for five days. I'm already nervous about class. I don't wanna go back. They've done a whole week. They, they've done two thirds of a unit. I'm not gonna know what's going on. Because we have other support services already in place, and I would like to throw my colleague Dante Lorende under the bus, uh, working in the ACE room all day with a greater variety of kids, might serve as an option for, we get them in the door, okay? We help to address the immediate concerns. We bring them in. Now you're here. You can pop in to a class, check in with the teacher, get the work, go down to the ACE room, spend the time that you need 
have access to an adult and have access to materials, now you're reducing that anxiety. Again, that negative feelings about being in the building. You can access the psychologist, the school nurse, you can get all of those things. If we keep you in the building, we're building those habits and behaviors. Because if you're in the building, you might be in the class. And if the class, you might be engaged. And if you're engaged, you're going to learn. So that's pretty much it. Uh, the last thing I didn't want to say, kind of go out there, is part of our board talks about, or part of our policy talks about the board's commitment to providing quality education. And their offering of a genuine effort to help. We can be truer to that genuine effort if we can identify kids sooner, support them easier, faster, get them in there. And what we will see is improved graduation rates, higher performance, all of the things that we are looking for. So that's pretty much my shtick. Any questions? Any questions? Mr. Hoffman. What does uh, the, the, the state of New Hampshire consider a half day? Is it would be two blocks um, for, uh, for us? Um, the stated policy doesn't delineate what, it const what constitutes a half day. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take my other knowledge from other research and try and impose an answer on that. We measure by minutes. That's a standard or by days. So if you're meeting half the hours, half the minutes, half the days, that constitutes a half. The argument would be that if you are constantly getting dismissed early, you're missing class time. So we want to focus on not just the kids who are out the whole day, but who are always coming in late, always coming in early, trying to figure out what that pattern is. Um, how might we define it? The board can take that and tinker with it, but uh, looking at it in a way other than a full day would help us to catch those kids who, and I don't mean in a punitive way, but identify those kids who are um, having difficulty within the class structure that might indicate that negative emotional feelings about being in school. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, because yeah, uh, we should be in line with the state standard. Right. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what that standard how they like how they how they look out. Yep. Yes. Do you have a rough number about how many kids fall in that tier two category? Who with a little more support could be more successful in school? Um about nine percent. So uh, so <laughs> nine percent of seventeen hundred I where did I put my sorry. I kept the percentage stuck in my head and I, I apologize that I didn't keep the math stuck in my head. Um Okay, so what are I, one of the things that I had to do is because our attendance data is aggregated to include tardies, dismissals, field trips, and absences. I worked backwards and uh, summarized that 30 to 40 percent of the total is actual absences. So that's about 157 kids. So 157 kids is 9% of the total population. So that's a big number. That's, yeah. That is not, be yeah, not insignificant, not insignificant. And then Dave and then well, Susan. Well, could a huge headache, but if they could sit in a rotating schedule to get the kids here at different times during the day? The, um, so a rotating schedule could help to reduce the number of kids in that truancy category who are affected with work and school responsibilities. Uh, our, our project looked specifically at um, school refusal. Whereas that may have an impact, I don't think that it would eliminate it. Yeah, so um, we could address one segment, but not the, the other. The other issue is too, we're uh, CTE regional hubs. And so yeah. if we change our schedule, and we noticed this when we implemented eBlock, when we changed our schedule, we needed to coordinate with all the other districts that work with us. Yeah. Yeah. Susan? Hi. Um, as a middle school teacher, I think we could do this in the middle school. I think one of the greatest issues that we deal with our students is student anxiety. Yep. And your idea of when the students come back in of having a place to work and get caught up before they get thrown in the classroom would probably 
reduce a lot of their anxiety. What a great idea. Angela, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to say, we do have modified at the high school. Right. So that could be in place of a rotating. If a student really had an issue in the morning, they could do a modified. And, that's, and we have seen a growth in modified. I don't have data to support this. Um, when modifieds were introduced a few years ago, it was one of those senior privileges um, for students who are, are meeting and exceeding the academic standard. Kind of like that tier of students that I talked about, those high-end uh, juniors and seniors who have completed coursework, who are, who are well underway, and it was, a, it was a perk. It has been used now to support a lot of those kids with those family and work responsibilities and also school anxiety. So we're seeing a number of kids whose anxiety and nervousness is being addressed by, and I, I apologize because this is all anecdotal for a variety of reasons, confidentiality, uh, privacy, things like that. The anecdotal evidence seemed to suggest that we're helping to deal with school anxiety by providing modifieds. I don't know how accurate that is, but one of the things that it does is it's keeping kids out of classrooms. So modifieds, depending on what the particular need of the student is, can work to reduce some of that population as well. I don't know what, how large of that uh, tier two segment it would, it would address them. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all very much.